We're back now with our regular weekly seminar, and um, this week I'm so excited to um, welcome Professor Maria Mawit Yonatan Yeshak. I hope I said that correctly. Um, she's a professor in pharmacognosy at the School of Pharmacy in the College of Health Sciences at Addis Ababa University. And um, I met um, the Professor Maria Mawit when we were together in a conference. Uh, it was a UNESCO um, science conference, and it was in Kigali. Uh, was that in um, June, I think? Yes, it was in June. Yeah. And it was such an interesting conference, and uh, I met a lot of interesting people, but um, Professor Mariam Mouet stayed stuck out to me um, because of the research she's doing. I wasn't aware. I know there's some work in Rwanda. I didn't know who else is doing that kind of research. And of course, it's really interesting for our center because it links to the bioeconomy and to valorizing biodiversity and traditional knowledge systems. Uh, so I was really pleased when you agreed to come and talk with us. So um, with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to you and just reminding people that if you have questions, um, you can put them in the chat or you can um, unmute and ask directly to the speaker at the end of her talk. So thanks so much, everybody. And um, let's kick it off. Yeah, thank you so much, Beth, for that kind introduction. It's an honor to be here and present in front of you guys. Uh, so I'm going to open the PowerPoint now. Um, the topic of uh, my uh, talk was natural product research in the, the Department of Pharmacognosy uh, at the Ababa University. The group uh, that does specifically this research is called uh, Bioactive Secondary Metabolites for Improving Life. That's the name of our group, or we call it BASIL in short. And uh, you see that the, some supporting organizations are listed down there. Uh, I will say a few words about Ethiopia and the role of natural products in drug discovery. And I will go through the basil side of the story with some examples. So basil is the name of our group. Uh, geographically, geographically, we are located quite close to Rwanda. Uh, in the eastern part of Africa, and we are the second most populous country in Africa now with about 115 million, uh, population of 115 million, and uh, our population is predominantly Christian. We have <clears throat> Muslim population and some traditional uh, religions are also practiced. Uh, this, uh, as we call it, Ethiopia is the land of origins. Uh, as you may know, your ancestor, Lucy, uh, with, who, who, who was 13 when she died and 3.5 million years old her skeleton is found now in our national museum uh, and uh, she's our closest uh, ancestor and she's an Ethiopian she was an Ethiopian uh, we are also claiming to be the uh, civilization the origin of the Nile civilization what you see here is the blue Nile falls so the Nile civilization with our own coins and our own alphabet started uh, millennia ago. That's why we call ourselves again the land of origins. Mm, Ethiopia is the land of the origin of coffee. You may know the story of the Kaldi, the shepherd, uh, who has seen, who was a pharmacognosist, I would say. Uh, he saw the goat who were uh, eating the berries of this uh, the shrub. Uh, or her herb were very excited and they were jumping around. So he collected some of the berries and gave it to the monks uh, nearby. And then the monks could pray all night long after they uh, ate the berries. And then the story of coffee started. Kaldi is the name of the shepherd. And now we have our own coffee ceremony, which is quite uh, popular. Uh, so the role of natural products uh, in discovery, why do we do natural products now uh, when there is a lot of technology around, a lot of computational chemistry, uh, a lot of um, AI going around? Uh, why are we still sticking to the classical natural products uh, research? Um, there, are, there are so many specific uh, unique features of natural products. As, uh, as we know now, 80% uh, of the drug in the pre-genomic era come, came from natural products and you see them in the pharmacy shelves. 
and 50% of the, dr the drugs approved between uh, 1981 and 2010, again, come from natural products one way or the other. And uh, natural products could be drugs by their own right. Uh, you don't have to do anything on that lead molecule. It can be used as uh, a drug molecule by itself after, of course, large scale production. And we know natural products have a lot of um, drug like properties or they serve as drugs for cancer, infectious diseases and the list goes on. Uh, they can also be insights for derivatives when you have a natural product and you cannot use it as a drug uh, because of certain characteristics which you don't want. Uh, you can still use it as um, a starting molecule or as an insight for creating derivatives. For example, cocaine uh, cannot be used, obviously, for it, uh, due to its addictive uh, nature, but it is our um, insight molecule to synthesize the local anesthetics, which are highly used, for example, in the dental medicine area. Uh, they can also be used as starting materials for synthesis of complex structures. There are some complex chemical structures uh, due to some uh, specific arrangements of the molecules, which we call stereochemistry, uh, which you can't you can't synthesize in the lab, or if you synthesize, you cannot specifically isolate that stereospecific molecule. In that case, you can use natural products as a st starting mo um, molecule. So the cholesterol ring, for example, from Byland, um, which is used in the uh, synthesis of uh, oral contraceptives is an example. Uh, they can also be invaluable pharmacological tools uh, because um, when we do AI or computational chemistry, and we are targeting a known receptor or a known physiological process, we only see what we want to see. But when you have a natural product and uh, say, for example, it comes from a traditional medicine claim, and then you taste it and then it is active, then when you study it, probably it could be showing a mechanism which we didn't know before. So uh, examples are, for example, we, people didn't know there were indigenous opioids in our brain before morphine came to the picture or the cannabinoid re receptors for that matter. Uh, the indigenous cannabinoid receptors we didn't know we had uh, were discovered after studying cannabis. So um, when we synthesize or when we do, as I said, computational chemistry, we target already known mechanisms. But when you have a natural product and it, uh, you study its activity and then uh, when you study its mechanism, it's open. It could be anything. It could be a surprise for you. So uh, the, they are invul invaluable pharmacological tools in this regard. Um, well, despite all this, uh, as uh, you may know, some of you know, the big pharma has significantly cut back uh, research on natural products during the uh, last decades of the 1990s because there was a lot of hope that uh, high throughput screening would bring some results and combinatorial and computational chemistry would also yield. Uh, but that didn't yield because the number of lead compounds to be tested significantly decreased and uh, the hope did not uh, realize or did not materialize because it could only be one chemical uh, that was approved within 25 years. That's the famous sorafenib uh, from Bayer. And uh, despite the cutting research, during that same time, 225 natural products uh, hit the clinical trial stage. So you can see that we are still dependent on Mother Nature uh, on finding, to find new drug molecules, especially with new um, uh, health challenges popping up. So natural products remain the best source of drugs and drug leads, and there are many publications coming on uh, that issue. Uh, but then how do we study natural products? Uh, it's quite a laborious and expensive research, and we have to do it strategically and efficiently. Uh, there are uh, different approaches to study natural products. You can do random selection, uh, you can just randomly go to your garden or to a jungle and say, I want to study this leaf or I want to study this fruit. Uh, well, that's an approach. Uh, there is also high throughput screening when people have uh, a lot of money in very expensive labs. Uh, you can do high throughput screening. You can collect as many 
claimed uh, or random selection could also be there. Uh, plant species as possible and then you taste them. Uh, that's what NIH did in the 1990s uh, to study or to find anti-HIV molecules. They tasted hundreds and hundreds of plant extracts through high throughput screening. But this is robotized tested and very expensive. And um, you can also follow uh, traditional medicine leaps, uh, uh, following a traditional medicine claim, and then collect that plant material and then study it. Which way uh, you do uh, as preferably as possible following from these strategies, we know that the most uh, effective one or uh, where you find high hit rates is when you follow traditional medicine. It's because many of the traditional medicine knowledge around the globe are tasted through years and years. So pretty much preliminary research has been done on those plants. So uh, the only thing you do would be bring it to the lab and give it more empirical data, empirical evidence uh, to be used in modern medicine. And there again, uh, there is a lot of publication on that. So when we come to our side of the story, the basal side of the story, uh, what do we do in our lab? That's what I would like to focus on today. Uh, we study secondary metabolites or plant molecules to target major infectious and <clears throat> infectious diseases. And by doing so, uh, we, we say uh, we will contribute our share to improve life or health. Uh, we are situated at the Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry and Pharmacognosy at Addis Ababa University. I am the group leader, and there are two professors uh, with me, and we have a lot of graduate students and some undergrads as well. Uh, we are funded by Addis Ababa University and the International Science Program, uh, Uppsala University. Uh, what we do uh, in Basel, uh, if, if we map it in one slide, is uh, we we navigate between fundamental and applied research. We document traditional medicine claims at the fundamental level, and then we do biological activity testing for claimed activity or pharmacological activity testing. And we try to isolate active compounds or active fractions. We do activity-guided uh, studies. And then we, we also perform structure activity relationship studies uh, we try to modify the structures of the isolated compounds to improve activity or to decrease toxicity or any undesired effect. And we also do standardization of herbal preparations. Uh, the WHO guideline now uh, allows herbal preparations or, <clears throat> sorry, uh, plant uh, active fractions. If they are standardized and their toxicity is studied, they could be used as they are. Uh, particularly, uh, especially if they come from traditional medicine. So we do standardization of herbal preparation. We mean by that is say, if, the, if somebody is selling 100 grams of green powder and uh, the seller claims it to be say Moringa, is it really Moringa? What should be the chemical composition? And uh, what should it contain and what it, sh it should not contain should be also be stated. It's like a pharmacopoeia for herbal preparations. Uh, and we do, of course, designing methods for evaluation or quality control. That's what I just explained. <coughs> Sorry. And we have uh, the premise we stand at is the Ethiopian traditional medicine. And uh, we rely on knowledge from the Ethiopian traditional medicine and the biodiversity, of, the rich biodiversity of the country. Uh, the Ethiopian traditional medicine is a subcategory of the African traditional medical system, but <coughs> due to some uh, geographic and ancient um, commercial exchange, uh, it has been quite <coughs> influenced by Egyptian and uh, Greek traditional medicines as, as well. So you can see some features from Egyptian or Greek traditional medicine in Ethiopian traditional medicine. And many of the Ethiopian traditional healers are uh, herb herbalists, they use a lot of medicinal plants, uh, and the sophistication, of course, um, varies. It ranges from people who use simply cut out leaves, crushed, and so on, to people who do actually extraction and then mix fractions and then uh, calculate doses. 
Uh, currently, 70% of our population still relies on traditional medicine, mainly due to access, uh, I mean, lack of access to uh, modern medicine, but also due to preference. Uh, according to a recent study, in fact, uh, nearly 100% of our population have used traditional medicine once in their lives, in their lifetime. And um, uh, the country is uh, the country's economy is also dependent on livestock. Uh, I think we stand number one in the livestock headcount in Africa. Uh, and 90% uh, of the livestock health is still kept by traditional medicine. Uh, uh, it doesn't also, uh, it doesn't only do uh, cure, but Ethiopian traditional medicine also gives prophylaxis and prevention uh, herbs for diseases as well. Uh, some of them could be associated with uh, some, uh, magical religious uh, practices, but you know WHO recognizes that as well uh, as traditional medicine as well. So we don't do uh, uh, we don't taste these things in the lab, but I'm just highlighting it as a feature of the Ethiopian traditional medicine. So I'm um, I'm warning uh, warning some of the slides are graphic, a bit graphic, but. Um, I want to show you, I don't know if you can see it clearly, the before and after treatment with uh, Ethiopian traditional medicine uh, herbs. So if you, if you see here uh, under the eye of the, this woman, there is a tumor or an, an, an ulcer like wound and after treatment, it has totally uh, healed here as well and here as well. So um, there are powerful herbs uh, in the traditional medicine and we cannot just ignore them and we cannot just say, no, we are scientists, we do modern medicine only. And then we cannot simply sit in our, you know, um, gated um, in, um, university community and then do not pay attention to traditional medicine. Number one, uh, many, um, a lot of our population relies on it. And number two, uh, it could actually contribute a lot to the primary health care of the community and probably the, we can even make uh, some APIs from the Ethiopian traditional medicine for uh, big pharma. Uh, the other premise we, we stand at is the biodiversity uh, of the country. Uh, the geographical or the topography of uh, the country ranges from uh, 140 meters below sea level from that to 4,000 meters above sea level. That's the range we have in Ethiopia. We have the the depression, the Danakil depression, which is 140 meters below sea level. And then you have the Ras Darshan, which is 4,000 uh, meters above sea level. Well, most of the country is quite high land zone. Uh, and we have about 8,000 plants this is recorded. And Ethiopia is one of the floral hotspots uh, in the world. So, uh, and 800 species with medicinal values have been recorded, and about 12% of them are endemic. They don't grow outside Ethiopia. And 60% uh, of the flora and 10% of the vascular flora is estimated to be uh, medicinal, according to a study by Pancras. And these are some of uh, the, yeah, the studies quoted here. So I'm bringing my, our research plan again to remind you what we do at uh, Basel. Uh, by standing at these two things, the two premises, the rich knowledge in traditional medicine and the, bio, the rich biodiversity, we could do uh, or we could uh, roll out our research plan. And how do we do it? Uh, we do ethnobotanical data collection from remote and isolated areas mainly because the the use of traditional medicine in such areas is highly um, pronounced than in the cities or uh, places which are closer to modern medicine access and then we collect plant materials with the traditional healers if they are uh, willing so this is for example an island on one of the lakes uh, and the, the inhabitants are quite segregated from <clears throat> or quite isolated from the mainland and uh, they don't actually have any hospital or anything there but uh, it's a quite healthy uh, community and uh, we studied them 
we did ethnobotanical data collection from them. And as I said, we, we take the traditional healers to the field so that they can show us the plant, what they mean by that plant. Uh, because if they, we, when in cases we record only names, a single name could serve uh, to name so many different species, similar species. So we want to know what they actually use. And whenever they are willing, uh, we go to the fields with them. And this is one of, actually, uh, he's, he's, now, he's not now alive, but he was one of the prominent uh, traditional healers we knew. So these are. After we collect the plant material, uh, we take uh, or we carry out activity guided fractionation. Uh, what we do is we take the plant material to the lab, we dry it, we extract it, and then we, we taste the crude extract first, and then we fractionate it, we taste the fractions, and then we follow the active one, the active fraction. And then we, we stop when the activity is diminishing. And then if we're lucky, we can isolate the active compound, the active principle. Uh, the active principle necessarily may not mean uh, the major principle, um, or the major uh, act, the major component uh, in the plant material, uh, but uh, what we do is purely activity guided study. So this is what I just explained, and I want to show you some examples of uh, characterization of cyclotides from Viola abyssinica. Uh, this plant, <clears throat> the, the Viola abyssinica plant is the plant which I did my PhD with, and the study was not particularly based on uh, reports from Ethiopian traditional medicine, but African traditional medicine. Uh, but we are interested in studying in these unique uh, type of mini proteins or uh, pep peptides. They, the biggest one contains only 37 amino acids, so mini proteins could be an exaggeration, but you can call them peptides. They are uh, called cyclotides because they are completely cyclic. Uh, as you can see, there is no head or tail to the molecule, uh, which is usually the case in even very big proteins. So the, the amino acids first make a chain, a sequence chain, and then the, they cyclize, the structure cyclizes. And then you have six cysteines, which form three disulfide bridges, which are knotted with each other. This topography <coughs> gives cyclotides an exceptional stability to uh, treatment with enzyme, treatment with heat, or any uh, uh, degrading treatment or destabilizing treatment. So unless you first reduce the disulfide bonds, you cannot even open the ring. So uh, the note is, so you have the cyclic uh, chain of the amino acids, and then you have the two disulfide bonds going like a bridge, and the third one knots. Uh, forms a true mathematical knot uh, between the two disulfide bonds. Uh, this is what makes the cyclotides very stable. <laughs> As I said, the story of the cyclotides starts uh, in uh, Central African Republic, not in Ethiopia. Uh, a plant known as Kalata Kalata, or uh, in its scientific name, Odelandia finis, uh, it's from Rubiaceae, the coffee family, uh, was. Uh, well, it is still actually used uh, by that, uh, that by that community to facilitate childbirth. It is uh, water extracted, and then it is administered orally or through the birth canal uh, for women who are in labor, and then the labor is facilitated. So uh, this was noticed by a Norwegian doctor who was on a Red Cross mission there, and then what it, what uh, strike what striked. Uh, the Norwegian doctor or the Norwegian physician was that the extract could be uh, administered orally and it could still be active, meaning no digestive enzymes could uh, affect its activity. And then uh, the same plant was um, observed in Zaire, particularly in Zaire. Uh, they prefer to use it orally than the scanner. And then uh, when they study, the compound was found to be a 29 amino acid polypeptide, which they called, the, um, the scientific uh, investigators called it Kalata B1. But they were not very sure to 
report it because uh, saying it, it's a peptide and it's orally available or orally uh, still available for activity uh, was, you know, a mis a s some sort of, uh, it could not be believed by that time because as we know, peptides are not that stable. But then several reports came later on, and then a complete 3D structure on Kalata B1 came uh, uh, by the end of 1995, and the term cyclotide uh, was also coined. So uh, we studied uh, that these cyclotides are quite confined to a certain class of, uh, a certain family of um, plants, the Rubiaceae and the Violaceae uh, are quite popular. Popular, but not all rubiaceae plants contain them. For example, coffee doesn't have any cyclotides, but almost all tasted violaceae plants contain contained cyclotides by the time we studied this. And the only uh, viola we have in Ethiopia is viola abyssinica. So we did extraction on viola abyssinica, and we could isolate, as you can see, uh, five new uh, peptides or five new cyclotypes, which we named VARB E, A, B, C, D, E. And VARB E is from another, it was already isolated from another plant by that time. And uh, why do we do uh, cyclotides? Is it only because the structure is fascinating or their st stability is fascinating or because they actually have inherent biological activity? Most cyclotides have inherent, cycle, uh, sorry, biological activity. Uh, they are defense molecules in the plants, so they are quite cytotoxic. And uh, the two cyclotides from uh, the Ethiopian viola abyssinica, VABI A and VABI D, could uh, exert cytotoxic assay, as you can see on the right corner of the slide, on the FMCA assay. The other thing is we can use this same structure uh, to, um, to carry uh, unstable sequences and then to administer them, to administer them. Uh, and uh, in, a, in another study, we could show that these cyclotypes could actually penetrate cell membrane at a certain concentration, and we could use them as uh, drug carriers due to their stable uh, nature. So we do, we are still uh, um, examining, you know, this is pretty much random, uh, not 100% random, but we are randomly uh, selecting Rubiaceae and Violaceae plants, another Rubiaceae, like Hibantus from the genus Hibantus, and then we are screening by small scale uh, extraction if they contain cyclotypes or not. It's, they are like a gem if you find them. We also do uh, screening of plants for anti HIV activity. Uh, about 30 higher plants uh, were selected on the basis of their ethnomedicinal uh, uses. Uh, and about 150 solvent extracts were prepared by our deputy leader, uh, Professor Kalab. And Combreta mole, or by its vernacular name, Weiba, uh, this is one of the endangered uh, trees, the red listed trees, maybe uh, quite uh, an interest to your center would be from conservation point of view, uh, because it is extensively used by women, uh, women of um, uh, sexually active age, from age 13 uh, uh, until, yeah, from age 13 and up, the barks and the stem of the, this tree uh, is fumigated, uh, is used as a fumigant. So uh, women, there are special uh, uh, stools or uh, holes prepared in every household in the northern part of Ethiopia, where the women would sit on that stool and then under that uh, stool or in that hole, uh, these, uh, the bark of this plant or the stem of this plant is fumigated through, uh, I mean, to her body. Uh, and it is uh, believed to be or it is used to treat malaria, TB, diarrhea, and wound healing, apart from the uh, traditional use by the women. And now uh, a new study has also come out, not from our group, but uh, from another uh, group, that it has actually anti-cancer effects on cervical <clears throat> cancer. But when it was studied for uh, anti-HIV activity, uh, as you could see, the EC50 was quite... Uh, uh, promising uh, 
uh, at only 1.9 microgram per ml, uh, it could uh, kill, of course, 50%, or the effective dose was uh, only 1.9 microgram per ml, and the selectivity index was 7. And the active compound was isolated to be punicalagin, and the, the EC50 of punicalagin was 1.11, very, very, very potent as compared to the crude extract. But as you could see, the selectivity index, uh, web, or as, as you also could see, the selectivity index was high. Uh, compared to the CMA was the standard. So the question is now, uh, we as academicians stop at this stage. Uh, and what we lack probably in Africa is uh, a big pharma or an industry which can pick up on this and then continue the work to make it available to the community commercially. Of course, high scale production of uh, this plant component would be the next, uh, the next logical research. Uh, we also do screening of uh, antibacterial activity extensively. I will be going through quickly. So about the 50 plants were screened so far uh, and uh, the traditional um, claim was treatment for skin infections, cough, typhoid fever, diarrhea and wound healing, which indicates some sort of infection and about 200 solvent extracts were prepared and the aloe harlana or the rate, uh, all, all aloes in Ethiopia are called rate. That's why I said earlier, we take the traditional healers themselves to uh, collect plant materials with us whenever possible. And a very promising compound, uh, which is 7 omethylaloracin A, was isolated, and it could uh, show uh, the minimum inhibitory concentration against multi-drug resistant bacterial stains was quite promising. It was 0 0.18 millimolar and 0 0.72 millimolar against Salmonella and Staphylococcus, respectively. So another uh, red listed tree is the uh, Varburgia ugadensis. And uh, it is called uh, beef 2 or Kanafa uh, with its uh, vernacular name. And these are the claims on its traditional use, stomachache, constipation, and so on. The list goes on. As you can see, people cut the bark and they uh, go on and go on cutting on the bark and then eventually the tree dies. So, this, this is how it is sold if you see i don't know if it's clear uh, this is how you find it in the traditional market it's even smoked and it was tasted for its antibacterial activities this is a thin layer chromatograph uh, chromatography we use uh, i brought it to show you how we do the phytochemical screening and these are the compounds isolated and it showed, I'm sorry, it showed some uh, antifungal activity, uh, as you can see. We also do uh, screening of uh, anti-malarial activity on plants and um, the, 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 what, the radioactive hyposanthine uptake is the method we use and we also use in vivo tests, the, the, the two weeks separation test as well. And the Knipophia foliosa, as you see it, this is not on red list. This is quite a uh, widely available plant. And the uh, lipid extract or the dichloromethane extract was active against uh, Plasmodium falciparum with ED50 of 3.8 microgram per ml. And cy cytotoxicity against the KB cells was 35.2 microgram per ml. And these are the active principles isolated. So the active principles could be new, or as you can see, it's a known structure, like as you can see the anthraquinones here. So we also do anti-inflammatory activity testing. Uh, this is Melilotus elegans, another widely found uh, plant, egug it's called. Uh, uh, it is used to close excavated wounds, sores, piles, mouse infection, uh, or hemorrhoids. Uh, the traditional healer actually underlined the hemorrhoids very much. That's why we studied it for anti-inflammatory activity. Uh, this is how they use it. And for bronchial asthma as well. Uh, we do, 
we study anti-inflammatory activity using plate simometer uh, using animals. We use animal models uh, as much as possible. We try to keep ethical standards. Uh, so uh, basically what you do is the uh, hind power of the rat or the, ma the, the, ma the mouse would be injected with um, carrageenan, a highly inflammatory uh, molecule, polymer, and then there will be swelling. That's, th that's how we induce, induce inflammation. But 30 minutes before the injection of the carrageenan, we feed the animal with the plant extract. And then we measure the power volume or the edema using the pleximometer, and we compare it with animals uh, that have not been injected or that have been given standards uh, against our extract. And this is how it looks. So uh, the total extract, as you can see, uh, uh, could induce significant uh, reduction in um, power edema, uh, which is comparative with indomethacin. The red one is indomethacin, a standard anti-inflammatory, and the green one, which you see, is the animal which didn't take any medicine. So this is the numbers. Uh, we do reverse phase solid phase extraction as well in doing phytochemical screening, uh, what we call solid phase extraction to fractionate. And then we could end up with robinine, uh, which actually we have to uh, yet taste because the activity of the robinine was not as promising as the fraction it contained. So we need to find the active ingredient in that fraction or we have to stop at that fraction and standardize that fraction. Uh, we also taste plants for non-communicative diseases, antihypertensive activity. I know I am really running out of time. Uh, this is Satureja punctata and uh, it is mainly claimed for hypertension. And we did uh, anti-hypertensive taste. And then in normotensive guinea pigs, in guinea pigs that have normal blood pressure, uh, it could lower uh, uh, the blood pressure on dose-dependent manner, as you could see. And in, um, or as you can, as you can see, pretreatment with um, KCL did not change the blood pressure lowering effect of um, the extract pretreatment with atropine. I'm sorry, the KCL is when we have the hypertensive ones, and it is of course dose dependent. And uh, the relaxation of pre-contracted aorta, we contract the isolated aorta by injecting KCL, the salt, and then you, as you can see on the graph, the contraction was released after the extract was introduced. And we did HPLC testing, activity guided characterization and all. And then uh, we could find two active ingredients, uh, actually rosmarinic acid. One of them was rosmarinic acid, uh, quite known uh, compound. And we have reported that in a publication and we stopped there. We also do standardization, as I said earlier, standardization of herbal preparations. And we start from the field material, the field the plants from the field, uh, we, we do extraction, and then we do micro, microscopic characterization, uh, physiochemical characterization, like swelling index, foaming index, the extractive values using different solvents, the moisture content. And when we do this, we collect samples from different places or across seasons. In case of Adjugari Mota, for example, we do it across seasons. Uh, one in autumn and uh, another one was collected in the spring. So according to uh, the standard given in pharmacopoeia, we do uh, all standardization studies, including microbial contamination, radioactive contamination, and some uh, instrumental analysis as well. And we do the FTIR printing. But what we say is uh, a standard Adjugari Mota should, should have this uh, fingerprinting in FTIR. That's the standard. And these are the marker molecules we could isolate uh, from the plant material. No, not necessarily the active ones, but the marker molecules. So my concluding remarks here would be the flora of Ethiopia is a rich source of medicinal plants. Uh, we agree on that. 
And uh, because medicinal plants have uh, social and economic values to the community, we should be uh, very careful in how to use them and uh, probably invent some uh, inventory research has to be there. Uh, how much of the trees are left, how much of uh, this plant is left. And then when we go to application, there should be some innovative ways to do or to prepare large scale of these molecules. Otherwise, you cannot keep on cutting the plants to prepare, of course, the tablets or the syrups. And uh, I acknowledge our graduate students, our National Herbarium and the Ethiopian Public Health Institute uh, for uh, supporting all our work, Addis Ababa University and Uppsala for funding, and of course the Ethiopian Young Academy of Sciences and to us are also our supporting organizations. And I, I invite you to visit the 13 months of sunshine land. We have 13 months in Ethiopia, 12 30 day months, and the 13th one has only five days and six days in each leap year. And today is actually day first of the 13th month, and to, this year is leap year, so it will have six days. And thank you. Oh, thank you so much. That was amazing. <laughs> really interesting. And I didn't know that about that um, leap year in the five days. <laughs> <laughs> really fascinating. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you very much. And um, I was really happy to see your connection with the National Herbarium. Um, that's fantastic because um, here in Rwanda, we also have the National Herbarium and we're really trying to connect research with plants and, uh, and also traditional medicine and medicinal plants with the National Herbarium work. So that was great to see. So I want to invite people, um, go ahead and you can put in the chat and you can also feel free to um, unmute and ask a question um, you can put your hand up if you um, need to if it gets hectic um, but yeah we we would love to have a little discussion or dialogue and we have enough time about 15 minutes so please feel free um, yeah thanks Elias I'm so glad you got to join it was really inspiring and I I hope that we can find a way to um, have a really dynamic group here that's um, doing the same kind of very systematic research on plants and valorizing the traditional medicine. I know some people here have already been doing that. Um, so yeah, Dennis, Dennis, um, go ahead. You have your hand up. Well, thank you. Um, firstly, I'm Dennis Quitonda, I'm a student in biochemistry in the University of Rwanda, College of Science and Technology. Um, it's a privilege to have this uh, presentation about in natural products. And uh, the problem I want to be uh, sure about is, uh, uh, <clears throat> is the, the ensure how can you be sure about this safety, safety of using uh, natural products in the, the sectors we can we can ensure that the natural products can be produced many many people think that natural products goes to uh, goes to their properties their photochemical properties about medicine being medicines uh, healing and the other different functions but for me i want to to understand do you ever think how we can use uh, those natural products in the cosmetic department or sector how can we use it and uh, how can we measure the safety or uh, up in in the sector of uh, cosmetics uh, or in the manufacturing uh, cosmetics by using uh, natural products. The safety, I, I want to hear from you, the safety about that. Thank you. I don't know if my question, see, I will go to my question. Yeah, I did, I did. Beth? Moderator. 
Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> yeah, um, you can go ahead and answer that um, and, and discuss with the Dennis and then we can go. I, I know there's several other comments and questions. So maybe you can answer that one. Um, Cause if you're like me, you may forget the question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, yeah, as you say, many people, uh, there's a myth that everything natural uh, can be safe. Uh, but it's a, it's a completely wrong myth. Uh, actually, we call plants are chemical assassins because they rely on chemicals uh, for their defense, for storing um, their uh, nutrients. Uh, I mean, for everything that, because they are physically uh, inhibited, because they cannot move physically, uh, what animals do um, to fight or to defend themselves physically is done by chemicals in plants. So they could be as dangerous as anything. Uh, and safety profile, as we have safety profiles for modern drugs, uh, we need safety profile for natural products as well. Uh, in our group, I didn't present it. For example, we study drug interactions with herbs. Uh, many people take, especially those on long-term medication like diabetic, hypertensive people, uh, they take the modern drugs, the prescribed drugs, and then thinking that uh, everything naturally is safe, they also take herbs by the side. And that could create a very serious or actually life-threatening uh, drug interaction. So what we advocate is, yes, traditional medicine is good. Uh, medicinal plants are the future probably. But we have to have the safety, the toxicity, the interaction profile studied for these plants before they are used, even in the cosmetic industry. Uh, so um, when you have something that has been used for millennia, WHO says, well, it has been tested actually in real life laboratory and it can be done, you know, light toxicity tests could be done, but there are guidelines to do such toxicity tests as well on such uh, plants. But even in cosmetic industry, uh, we cannot use them just left and right as we wish. So at least minimum uh, safety standards, which are set by WHO and procedures are given, uh, should be carried out uh, to have the profile of those drugs. And uh, on the chat, I see that, um, uh, um, yeah, at which level are you in Ethiopia regarding producing medical products uh, from plants? Uh, I can say we are on level zero. Uh, the traditional healers are still uh, commercializing their products, but in their traditional shops and in the traditional way. Um, but because such profiles are missing, uh, because we don't have a uh, compendia, uh, well, we, don't, we don't have compendia for our uh, medicinal plants, uh, even if they are produced, there is no uh, regulatory mechanism. So we are, we are still yet to work on that, uh, that I would say. Yeah, that's really, that's very interesting. I know that here in Rwanda, that would be desirable as well. Um, and I saw, let's see, I think, yeah, Justin, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Professor. I really thank you for inviting me on to this conference presentation. Uh, I know Ethiopia is very advanced about natural products. Uh, represent, I mean, you know, the professor, Elias Dagi, he's a friend of mine for a long time. From we met every two years. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Yes, uh, uh, we met every two years for an Africa Symposium. Okay. <laughs> so, I think uh, in the future we meet physically. So, um, I am a chemist uh, and uh, my area is natural products. So this is exactly my, my, it is my interest to, to attend this conference. Uh, I have two questions about standardization. Standardization, we have a problem of, of some plants, some grow in the world, others cultivated. It, you think that it's easy to make a, a standard about the extracts from both, both sides in the world and then and they cultivated. Another thing is, um, you know, this area we have to collaborate with the practitioner of traditional medicine. And uh, how Ethiopia, uh, in Ethiopia, you experience how scientists collaborate with uh, traditional medicine practitioners. 
Is there any re regulation of uh, tradition, traditional medicine in uh, Ethiopia? Regulation. Okay. All right. Um, shall I bet? Sorry. <laughs> yes, please. I keep being <laughs> muted. Yeah. So, um, let me start from the second question. Uh, there is a regulation uh, which is about uh, or nearly 100 years old, which, was, which came out during the emperor's time, that a traditional healer can open a shop and as long as there is no adverse effect reported or days reported, she or he can continue practicing. So our traditional healers are using that regulation, that article on that uh, proclamation until today to open their shops. But uh, despite, I mean, despite the... A lot of uh, you know discussion about traditional medicine, identifying an API from traditional medicine. Traditional medicine should cover the primary health care and so on. Uh, I wouldn't say there is a sound and uh, you know practical regulation out yet from our version of the FDA. We call it FDA, Ethiopian Food and Drug uh, Authority. Mm -hmm. uh, they, there are always conferences, there are always discussions, but not really regulations. Uh, we. Um, we work on the, we work with them on uh, you know by creating um, a collaborative and you know a friendly uh, relationship with them many of them wouldn't tell us their real uh, remedies well it's their uh, their livelihood depends on it but when they do they are honest and then i feel that sometimes we are simply fishing from them we do not give them anything in return i'm mean, not in, i'm not talking about monetary values but if we give them some simple trainings and, you know, simpler ways to do the extraction and so on, uh, that could be that could have, that could have made the collaboration uh, two way. But uh, but for now, it's a one way traffic. We go, we bring information, and then we use it. Uh, that's uh, how we do. It. And for the okay. standardization, yeah, uh, is it wild or cultivated? Uh, that we 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 use um, wild samples. I mean, you can use cultivated, but uh when you want to show actually uh across time across place across habitat you don't want to control the the way the plants are growing and you know greenhouse um, grown plants or cultivated plants sometimes uh, do not produce secondary metabolites as wild plants do because they don't need it for survival when you have the cultivated ones but of course uh, it will be one more data or it will um, what do you call it? Enrich your data uh, if you have the source from the cultivated, uh, if you do the profiling of the cultivated plants as well. Um, and if you are working in this area, uh, I mean, we can, for example, pick an herb which grows in Ethiopia. And if you are in Rwanda, in Rwanda and across season, and then we can do uh, the standardization, for example. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, I see that. Um, yeah, thanks, Manat, for your comment. And Blaze um, was asking prescriptions of traditional medicine tend to be secretive. And you just mentioned that. But do you find the correlation between disease claimed by traditional healers and modern techniques you use? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, as, as a researcher in this field, uh, what you need to be expert is, uh, an expert on is to understand that traditional healers or traditional medicine has its own language, uh, its own way of defining diseases and its own way of diagnosis and so on. So they don't have to necessarily speak our language. For example, when we go out and looking for something working for malaria, uh, well, malaria is quite important for it, but uh, for example, for cancer, if you go to a traditional healer and ask them, do you have anything for cancer? They don't know what cancer is. But then if you tell them, if you start describing uh, some tumor characteristics and so on, then they have, you know, descriptions of such things. So for malaria, for example, if they don't have anything for malaria, they may tell you, oh, this thing works for fever, uh, fever that lasts long and then does this and does that to the patient. And then you say, oh, OK, this could be working for uh, malaria, for example, uh, uh, for hemorrhoids, I showed you one example, the Melulotus elegans. It is used for hemorrhoids but and asthma. Both are inflammatory diseases, so we taste them for inflammation. 
Uh, but then uh, there are cases where traditional healers claim the plant to be active and it comes out to be totally inactive. Uh, that doesn't mean that the claim is totally false. It could mean that the model we used did not bring out the activity. So uh, that can, that's, that these are the scenarios uh, which you face when you do this kind of research. Okay, it's really interesting. Um, Oh, so um, Professor Bizuru is asking if you can share the presentation. Uh, yes, I can share the published data uh, and the publications, and then yeah, some slides I will bring out. Good. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay. Um, well, we're we're about a minute away from three. Oh, it's three now. We like to stay right on the time so that people know what to expect. So thank you all so much. Um, we really appreciate all of you joining, students and researchers and uh, from NGOs and government. It's so exciting to see all of you here. And thank you so much, Maria Mawit. Um, you, we really appreciate your time talking to us here. And um, yeah, we hope that maybe there can be some other collaborations between our universities and our research programs. So. Um, keep us in mind as well, because we do have some researchers here working in these areas. We are work, we are managing the national herbarium, so I think there's a lot of overlapping interest. Thank you so much. As I said, it was an honor, and I look forward so, to many more collaborations with you guys. Oh, wonderful. And I'm, oh, when it's I, virtual, I can I can also attend some of the presentations. Absolutely, yes. Um, yeah, we need to make sure you get uh, the invites. Um, oh, so I just saw um, Eric Bizimana, he was asking quickly, maybe in like um, a minute or so, what's the next um, steps, perspectives in the future from your point of view? Um, yeah, uh, our perspective is to push on the application of this basic research that we have done. Many of the research findings have been published and they are shelved, uh, but we want to push it for uh, application. As we say, we want uh, to contribute something for improving life, livelihoods of our uh, countrymen and women and human beings in general. So we want to engage with policymakers and then push towards making these things available to the public. That's our next pass. Our, that's what yeah, thank you very much. That's great. That's good food for thought here. So um, thank you again. Thanks, everybody. And um, I think we have a talk organized. Vinan Zibaza is the one who organizes the talk, these talks. So um, I'm sure we have one ready for next week. And, um, and we hope to see all of you here next week. Have a great day. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.